very few in number, so probably not going to be able to get too much out of them in terms of good performance. But you never... You never know. Hello and welcome back to the Ronin, and today I'm just going to warn you, I am a little bit more tired than I usually am, and uh, that might mean that my energy level is a little lower, and as a result I might seem even more mon monotone uh, and, and uh, kind of slow <laughs> than I usually do. Anyway, <laughs> if you are using this video as kind of like a relaxation thing, then well, yeah, you know, maybe maybe this is going to help. Anyway, point is, we are here at Saniopa, and I am attempting to besiege it. Now, unfortunately, because of the way that the camera works in Bannerlord at the moment, I'm unable to scroll out any further than this. And as a result, I won't be able to show you the surrounding area. Although I, I can kind of show you if I just, you know rotate the camera a little bit but basically I've taken a number of castles in the area I decided that I would just go ahead and take these castles off screen because most of them are very lightly defended and really don't have that much in the way of a challenge to offer us and so I basically just went in um, destroyed a couple of the defenders with you know siege bombardment damage and then I went in with an auto resolve easy enough and I built up my army just by going to my garrisons. Oh yeah, that's also something that I wanted to mention as well. Basically, someone someone asked me in one of the previous episodes comment sections why I'm not using my improved garrisons mod to the fullest because I have so much money that it would make sense for me to upgrade my units to the maximum tier and um, and then then use those. Now, okay. So here's the thing. The reason why I don't do that is, uh, I think I've explained this in the past, but maybe you missed that. I don't know. But anyway, the reason why I don't do that is not because I don't have the ability to do so, because obviously I do have the ability to do so. I have a, a significant amount of cash. But the main reason why I don't is balancing. Um, personally, I feel like if you, if you were to do that, I've done a, a lot of extensive testing with the Improved Garrisons mod in previous series as well not in actual live live series in other words like i haven't actually used the results of that um, of those tests um, in an actual series itself but in general in my off-screen time when i've had a little bit of extra ability to do so i've tested out a couple of uh, various theories that i had and um, it, one of those was using improved garrisons and seeing how how powerful i could actually make one garrison because I, I had an idea about a particular um, particular setting for a series that I thought might be quite cool. Um, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure how it would work, but I think it would work quite, quite nicely. But I'm not going to reveal what it is because it's kind of a bit unique. And I'm not entirely sure if it's actually going to be something that will appear on the channel in the future. But it was a while ago that I tested this out and it may not even work anymore. But anyway, point is... Leveling things to tier 6 straight away with improved garrisons. I mean, obviously, it's, it's not straight away. It does take a little bit of time for the trainers to, you know, actually do their magic. But that's the thing. I don't really want to draw, like, 100 tier 6 units out of a garrison instantaneously and then be like, here, I have this many units and so on. Um, I feel like that's a little bit unrealistic I guess and that's the reason why I kind of t uh, choose to limit myself in such a way so that I'm only using tier 4 units from towns and tier 3 units from castles maximum and my army at the moment as you can quite clearly tell is not even comprised of anything too dramatic I mean I did go into Tetsujin territory a little bit but for the most part the um, the recruits that I'm leveling up here are Imperials because I wanted to get a good start on the Batanians because obviously if you've seen the previous episode you would know that we actually started to fight against the Batanians and they were monstrous they were really really strong but we have worn them down a little bit you know we've worn them down and um, we've inflicted a lot of casualties I think I think these are the amounts of casualties that we've inflicted. It's a bit confusing which one is which, to be honest, because I assume that they have inflicted 9,800 and we've inflicted 15,000. I believe that's how it's supposed to be read. Anyway, we have basically 
2,000 more combat strength than they do. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm actually pretty happy with that. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to continue to push our advantage even further in this episode. And hopefully we're going to be able to take Saniopa. And I would also like to take another town in the form of... Um, uh, what, what is that one again? Uh, Amitatis or something like that? I can't remember the name um, specifically, but something along those lines. And um, I would like to be able to take that too. Because bear in mind, this is actually not even a Batanian town. This is an empire town. And, um, well, I decided to take it because it's basically on the way, you know. It's on the way to where we want to go. And I would like to take it eventually, of course. So I thought, why don't I just take it right now and save myself the trouble of coming back here later? Or, at the very least, maybe some Batanians are going to decide to, you know, do a little bit of besieging here and there and maybe try to take it for themselves or something along those lines anyway there we go oh yeah we got some fires lit Ooh, very nice i like it all right so obviously the walls are down so we really don't even have to worry about anything at all we can pretty much just run in here and do our thing and uh, bear in mind that i'm actually using the might be quite good pole arm because I personally like the reach much more than the shorter version that we made. Anyway, I'm going to try and get this guy. Oh, nice headshot. Oh, and he was replaced immediately. That's not very nice. Oh, never mind. He got murdered by a Palatine guard. Did you see that? That was actually pretty crazy. I like it. All right, very good work. And let me just see here. Just got to be a bit careful. Nice. Okay, I'm going to continue to try and level up my crossbow skill. Anytime I can get a headshot is a good day. And they're not even they're not even using their shields for some reason. Not entirely sure why that is. But I guess um I guess that's good for me, you know. Oh, there we go. Now they're starting to use their shields. All right. I'm going to actually try and level up my two-handed uh, weapon proficiency a little bit here cuz I noticed that my two-handed skill is almost at 150, I believe. So it would be quite nice to level it up and uh, finally get that last little little perk point spent and we'll see what we can do with it but obviously the enemy really doesn't have anything too dramatic that they're going to be able to stop us with i mean it's highly unlikely that they'll have anything too good here most of their defenders are indeed militia so you know militia is just not going to be enough to be able to beat these units but they're going to be good for getting me some experience which is exactly what i want I'm at 147. Oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get 150 in this particular um, in this particular siege, but we can try. You know, we can try. Anytime you're able to get a kill as well, it seems to give you a much bigger bonus to experience. So if I can do that, then that would be the most adv advantageous for us. Uh, anyone, anyone coming over here? No one's coming over here. All right. Well, apparently they are all running a different way, or they're just not wanting to run this way. I don't blame them, to be honest. If you saw this guy in your path with a massive two-handed sword, and he looked extremely intimidating. I mean, just look at him. He looks intimidating, no? I feel like he looks intimidating in his black armor. And he has a really cool, like, dark red design on his chest plate and all that wonderful stuff. Ooh, hello there. Someone seems to be running away. Hello. Right. Well, that, that worked. Oh, now I hit him. Of course. Now I hit him. I was hopeful for the headshot there, but at least we did get a small amount of experience for our crossbow. Not too much, but still. Not bad. Um, yeah, I've t also taken uh, into account that I'm not really going to be um, capturing too many prisoners at this point. Mainly because I don't really want to deal with them at all at this, at this moment in time. I'd like to just move on as fast as I possibly can and try to take as much land as possible. And that's pretty much it. Anyway, let's just take a quick look here. Yeah, so I have 147 in two-handed, and I have 196 in pole arms. I'm actually looking forward to checking out the 200-level perks. There's only one 150 perk. Ah, yes. You can deflect arrows with two-handed weapons while changing block positions. All right, so... As far as I am aware, this is not implemented in 1.5.5, which is the version I'm playing on. I will check Bannerlord perks 
if we are able to get to um, um, what is it 150 yeah if we're able to get to 150 today then I will check it but I yeah I don't think I don't think it's working uh, also this siege thing this siege icon right here that's bugged um, as you can quite clearly see here there are no sieges going on or anything like that so yeah that's just a a display bug that's happening and we also have a little bit of an issue here apparently the Batanians took back Varagos castle but it has now been taken once again by our forces which is absolutely fantastic I, I gotta say I feel like the Tetsujin are much more active in their pursuit of territorial control and everything they seem to be much more impactful shall we say in their pursuit of that goal than most of the other factions because I've been a part of pretty much every faction so far in Bannerlord and with the exception of a few the Tetsujin seem to be one of the most aggressive which is actually really nice it's really nice to see that because usually I'm going to be the only one that's going to be really aggressive and trying to take stuff and um, the other people will kind of hang back a little bit they might try to take something but they'll usually be a little bit like humming and harring most of the time and not really knowing what they're supposed to do or where they're supposed to go and so um, in, the, in that way the Tetsujin are certainly having a, a pretty big advantage anyway let's now move on to Amatatis over there and uh, this is actually what the map looks like right now as you can see um, I haven't, ch haven't really taken anything too dramatic um, the AI took Gauss Castle I did not take that I took Sestadime Castle, obviously, in the previous episode. And then I just took Thorios Castle, had about 250 units in there. I took uh, Varagos Castle, which had, I think, 177. And then, obviously, you've just seen Seniopa. So nothing really too dramatic has, has happened. But, um, yeah, everything seems to be working very nicely in our favor. And I'm actually very surprised that the Batanians are... I, I feel like they're just laying down. Aren't they just laying down and, and just taking whatever we deal to them at the moment? It, it, it feels like that, at least. So let's see whether that, that trend continues. Not entirely sure if it will, because no doubt they're going to, you know, be forming a very large party of, well, dangerous units. And there we go. We've got another 35 people leveling up right there. We've got some more Palatine Guards to add to the ranks. We've got some more Legionaries as well. Just look at how many of these guys I actually have. These are all tier 4 units, and they've all leveled up from tier 2, tier 3, and they level up so incredibly quickly, so that's obviously something to bear in mind too. Now, the amount of defenders here is actually quite staggering, so I'm a bit worried about that, but I can only hope that an army will not appear and then get the defenders to sally out, because if they sally out, that's going to be a bit of a problem, having over, what, I don't know, 1600 units fighting us on a on a the field battle that's gonna be that's gonna be extremely dangerous for us but I'm hopeful that that will not take place because it seems to me like most of the Batanian vassals uh, make peace with the Northern Empire all right yeah anyway as I was saying I'm just gonna finish that thought most of the Batanian vassals are shall we say uh, indisposed <laughs> they seem to be um, they're either prisoners or they're either, you know, rebuilding their armies or something along those lines. I, I'm not entirely sure if they're at war against anyone else. Anyway, what we're going to do is I'm actually going to make peace with these guys. We are going to be receiving tribute, which is wonderful. So I'm pretty happy with that. And we have just taken something from them as far as I'm aware. I believe Saniopa was theirs, wasn't it? I think so. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. You know, it's a nice little gain for not too much effort. And there's peace. All right, so let me actually just take a quick look here. No, they're not at war with anyone else except us, as far as I'm aware. So that's interesting. I feel like the Azariah are probably going to be declaring war again soon. Mm, Vlandians and Sturgeons have not touched us one bit, which is actually quite, quite good, but surprising, to say the least. I suppose it's because they are so far away from our territory that they... Just don't really care about us that much which is perfectly understandable considering the sturgeons are being picked on by the batanians in such a dramatic fashion which is one of the also main reasons why i actually wanted to try and dismantle the batanians as much as possible because if we're able to do that 
it's going to alleviate the pressure on the other factions in the game and it's going to make the whole experience in Calradia much more dynamic because I don't want one faction to become extremely powerful and then just continue snowballing all the others and uh, just, you know, rolling over them with reckless abandon, pretty much. Oh, yeah, there we go. The Crusade have declared war. Okay, well, they're at war against a number of other people as well, as you can see. They're at war against the Northern Empire, Western Empire, and the Southern Empire. Oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Anyway, um, it seems like we could make peace with the Batanians. We have a 39% support there, but Batania, in my opinion, really needs to suffer a little bit more, in my opinion. So let's just see if we can maybe make that happen before they declare peace with us. And I'm actually kind of surprised that we're losing our trebuchets so fast. That's also the reason why I've always said that I personally don't like ballistas. I think ballistas are super, super powerful because they are able to be rebuilt so fast. Okay, here we go. Yeah, this is going to be a bit of a problem. Let's just take a quick look at this guy's army. I'm a bit worried about it. Let's have a look. Okay, so decent amount of Imperials. They've got some high tier units, actually. Tier 6, um, sometimes at least, a little bit. All right, I'm just going to let it happen, and we'll see what uh, what kind of combat strength we have going on here. I think we should be able to achieve victory, but they do outnumber us by a pretty significant margin. I'm a little bit worried about that, but I don't think that that is going to be too bad. I think I'm on a horse. Aren't I on a horse? Yes, I am. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I'm using an Azurai horse at the moment. I don't know whether I should actually replace that with something else, like, for example, this. Um, I mean, if you take a look at the green numbers, you know, because obviously green indicates that that's slightly better, then you would think that the Step War Horse is better in every single respect, but you've got to look at the speed, you see, because the, the current horse that I have has 66 speed, whereas the Step War Horse only has 50. So obviously that's a thing that uh, you might want to take into account there. There's obviously a number of other horses here, but now we are far away from the War Horse section so it really depends whether you want more maneuverability and hit points over speed or whether you just want speed personally for me i would much rather have the speed so that's why i'm going to be keeping with that anyway let's move in and see what we can do here i don't know what kind of battlefield we're going to get but i would hope that it's probably going to be one where there's a river in the middle i think yes indeed it seems like there is one um now we just need to <laughs> make sure that we take good advantage of it if we can i'm a little bit worried that the enemy is going to have already moved across the river by the time we get there or they might not even be on the other side as is the case here yes they are quite clearly not on the other side all right well can't really do much about that i suppose but anyway let's just take a quick look here okay so we have a huge amount of infantry this is way too much infantry in my opinion not a big fan of that but what can you do, really? What can you do? All right, so let's just move our infantry into a nice position. Let's get our archers over here. We have so few archers, it's really kind of sad. I um, actually thought we had a pretty significant number of them, but apparently not. Let's try and murder these guys. Oh, look at that. 300 XP for a blocked attack. That says everything you need to know. Massive damage, massive damage. Let's try and just not get killed, shall we? Nice. Nice little bit of damage right there. Are you serious? Are you serious, sir? Are you really wanting to attack me that badly? Okay, well, let's tell my uh, let's tell my infantry to charge in. And these gu oh, these guys are really harsh. These guys are really really harsh. Okay, well, let's tell them to charge in. We'll tell these guys to go into a nice loose formation. And I have a I have a pretty you know I have a bad feeling about this. Okay, uh, I don't really want to use overheads, thank you very much. <laughs> Not entirely sure why that's happening, but alright. Okay, take him down. Alright, we seem to be doing okay so far. Okay, now we're going to just reconsolidate real quick. And I'm actually going to start moving my forces back a little bit here as well. So let's just move these guys over here. Let's get my uh, let's get my cavalry to come back as well. Because what I want to do is I want to make it so that we're not too far away from our reinforcement point. If we're too far away from that, it's going to make everything just that much more difficult. 
Ooh, take out his horse. Unfortunately, uh, not able to take out the rider, but thankfully he did get shot and killed after that. And there's one of the vassals. Nice. Taking him down. I like that. going to tell the infantry to charge in once again to try and eliminate a lot of the cavalry that are in this area and we're going to tell our cavalry to charge in as well unfortunately we don't have any horse archers are you serious oh yeah we have some horse archers but they are very few in number so probably not going to be able to get too much out of them in terms of good performance but you never you never know huh Well, uh, that's frustrating. That is actually um, that is actually incredibly frustrating. I'm very surprised that that actually happened. That guy had a one-handed. Can you can you believe that? Can you believe that he literally had a one-handed weapon and was able to hit me? Wow. I, I guess that just shows, you know, that just shows the advantage that the AI tends to have in terms of timing. They're just so, so good. They're almost perfect with their timings. Um, they really are. Um, fortunately, because we had a slight combat strength advantage, we are able to achieve a victory here. I actually thought I was doing pretty well up until that, that one hit kill. Very surprised that I actually got taken out in one shot as well. I, uh, I, I didn't think I actually took that much damage initially, but... Apparently I did. Apparently I did, but there you go. That is indeed a victory for us, and uh, <laughs> I don't I don't even really care about the Renown at this point. The Renown is just um, kind of negligible in comparison to the amount of units we lost. We lost 148, which is not that bad, if you think about it, because we did take out one of the largest Batinian armies we've seen so far, and that's pretty good, you know? That is pretty good. So we're just going to take every single one of these guys prisoner as much as I possibly can at least. And then we're just going to level up a couple more people. As you can see, these guys, 42 of them leveled up into um, legionaries. And now I have so many of these guys. That's the reason why we had so much infantry in that fight. Now, here's the thing. And this, this may shock you, you know. This may shock you. But if all of these legionaries were instead Palatine Guards... Uh, we probably would have won that, you know, five minutes earlier or something, just purely for the fact that Palatine Guards are, in my opinion, some of the best archers that you're ever going to see, apart from, of course, Tetsujin archers. I personally feel like Tetsujin archers are much better, but obviously that's, that's, that's just my opinion, and uh, obviously their stats do speak for themselves, but, you know, out of the base game... I personally feel like Palatine Guards are really good. If you can get them, Batanian Fian Champions are, of course, much better. But that is a uh, eh, kind of a rarity because they are indeed noble units. And it seems like I'm going to have to run away here. I didn't want to have to do that. But as you can see, he's coming out with an army now. And I'm going to need to take care of ourselves quite a bit here. Uh, we do have a lot of units that are wounded at the moment. So that's obviously something that is not really that big a deal. I mean, we can obviously, you know, get them to be restored over time and, and all that wonderful stuff. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Cyronea. I'm going to take a look at the garrison there. I'm going to pull out some more lower tier units to, you know, to, to hopefully level them up and, and things like that. And uh, hopefully we'll also be able to restore ourselves as we are moving around too. I mean, you can already see that we've built up our army back up to 250 all the way from 119 or whatever so hopefully that's going to continue and then we'll be able to head back to Amatatis. Ah what do we have here? It appears as though the Kuzate is now starting their offensive against us and uh, they've already taken Varagos Castle but in my opinion this is basically a fruitless endeavor for them. I really don't understand why they would do that because Saniopa is right next door, and I would assume that that has a much greater value, but obviously they don't think so, or they're just not able to take it. As you can see right here, we have 
a pretty significant numbers advantage. We're going to be going in manually, however, because I would like to try and level up my skills just that little bit more. And we've also done a little bit of resorting of our armies as well. So I've kind of tried to distribute my infantry and archers just that little bit better between our clan members. And we'll see how that goes. Anyway, I think I, I'm not a big fan of this map. This kind of map is really not my thing. It is. Uh, it's a bit weird, really, because on the one hand, it's quite obviously rather open, because obviously, I mean, you can see that. You know, it's it's an outside area, of course. It's not inside or anything, but it feels a little bit claustrophobic. And I don't know why that is. It feels very closed in. It's all because of the trees, I assume. Um, but it makes it feel like it's much more confined than it actually is in reality. And that kind of makes me a little bit antsy, because on the one hand, I would love to be able to just run and run and run throughout these fields, and indeed the hills as well, but it is very, very difficult to do that when... Well, there's a tree every two meters or whatever, but yeah, that's, uh, that's actually kind of... <laughs> It's kind of bad, you know, it's kind of bad. So we'll see what we can do. Obviously, most of these trees are solid, but some of them you can walk through. This one, I think? No? Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. Apparently, they've made more of the thin or more of the thinner trees um, non-clippable. So that's actually pretty good. Anyway, let's just try and murder a couple of people. I'm almost at 200 after all. So we should probably make the most of it. Let's tell my archers to go into a loose formation as well. Hopefully they're going to be able to murder a lot of these horse archers. Not a big fan of horse archers, as I've said. But we're not going to go over that again. No, we're not going to go over that again. But you can already tell the reason why I don't really like them. They seem to be able to kill our units so incredibly easily. And hopefully we're going to be able to teach the Kuzeta lesson. That they will not ever win against us. Or at least... We can hope that they will get the message eventually and then they might leave us alone or something, but generally we are now at war against two of the strongest factions in the game and uh, that uh, that's a bit, uh, bit of a cause for concern, potentially. Anyway, we're just going to move our infantry a little bit forward here. I'm going to try and do a little more damage. Got to be careful though because I don't really want to be in a situation where I get murdered by a one-handed weapon user again because that was... That was actually kind of shocking, to be honest. I feel like I should not be in a situation that is going to get me killed in that way. I feel like that is completely unacceptable, to be honest. A, a person that has a polearm such as this should never, ever die from someone that has a one-handed weapon on horseback. Maybe in a close quarter situation, sure, yeah, yeah, you know. Close quarter situation, no problem at all. Because a one-handed weapon user is always going to beat a polearm user in that in that aspect or should in theory if their skills are equal however in a field battle a polearm should always win at least in my opinion so yeah that's definitely something that i need to work on a little bit more i need to work on my my observation skills i think the observation of the opponent making sure that we know exactly what is coming at us and when because i actually saw that he had a one-handed weapon but I thought to myself, surely he's not going to be able to do anything, you know? Surely he's not going to be able to defeat us with that. And so I'm giving them a bit more of a, um, yeah, shall we say a bit more leeway, I guess you could call it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm basically just being extremely cautious and um, trying not to get myself killed. We are losing a lot of units, however. Ah, the tree actually stopped us right there. Ah, yeah, that could have killed me right there. That was a couch lance. That was a couch lance from that from that lancer right there. That was uh, that was pretty pretty scary actually.
Ooh, that guy was also attempting it. Do you see that? They're, they're literally like almost laser guided towards us. That's pretty crazy. Anyway, we have now reached 200 polearm proficiency. Who would have expected that? I, I don't even know whether I've had a character that has ever had 200 polearm proficiency. I think of, yeah, I think, I, yeah, actually, never mind. I think the original Byron, the one that played in the Kuzade Carnate series, I believe he used a polearm as well as a bow, of course, because he was a horse archer. So that kind of makes sense. But yeah, I think he had a pretty significant amount of polearm skill. Maybe not as much as this guy. I'm actually not sure about that in the later stages of the campaign. Bear in mind that the original Byron actually lived an extremely long life. And um, I think he actually reached age... What was it now? I think he was like age 80 or something. Something crazy like that. So yeah, if you want to see any kind of like late stage gameplay with like a really old character, then... Uh, well, that's the series for you. But anyway, let's just see what we've leveled up here. Yeah, we have more of these Imperial Veteran Archers. I've transferred all of my Palatine Guards away from my army and given them to one of my clan members, because that's generally what I tend to do. I tend to donate a bunch of my highest leveled units over to them, because I, I personally feel like it makes no sense for me to have tier 6 Imperials um, and uh, just kind of lug them around all the time when they could be in someone else's army helping them out and, 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 you know, and by proxy helping us out because they're in my army. So it kind of works. But uh, yeah, I'm not giving Tetsujin units or anything like that. No! Oh, that is... Okay, well, that's actually really sad. Yeah. That is actually really sad because she had a, well, I mean, apart from the fact that she was extremely good at her job, she was really, really good. Um, a number of vassals were released now as a result of her demise. Ah, that's actually a pretty big blow because um, I don't know whether you noticed, but she seemed to be leveling up at an, a, a pretty astonishing rate and uh, she was actually really strong. But unfortunately, she has now perished. So I'm kind of sad about that oh well never mind press f you know press f anyway uh troops in your formation gain plus five hit points reduces recruitment cost of infantry troops by 20 percent govern troops <laughs> right okay these are w why is this in the polearm tree why is this in the polearm tree i have no idea i have no patience for terrible perks today so I'm going to literally just take drills, I guess. All troops in party gain additional plus one experience per day. Plus one? I mean, spare it, you know? Really? Come on now. I mean, it's such a late, late perk in the polearm tree, and they give you one experience per day? I mean, come on. That could be so much better and so much more interesting. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, yeah, you know my thoughts on these things. I feel like... Most of these later game perks should feel impactful when you take them, and you should feel, hey, you know what? I actually spent that perk point in a useful manner, and I'm actually happy with my selection. But no, no, I'm getting plus one experience per day. <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous, in my opinion. It's absolutely ridiculous. Oh, well, never mind. You know my thoughts. Anyway, we're going to be taking Varagos Castle in a real quick second here. I could technically just go in for an auto resolve, but I wanted to try and destroy as many of the units as I could. There we go, there's 14, and we took one casualty, which wasn't even a death, which is fantastic. And we were now able to do that. Oh, w were there some vassals, actually? I think there were some vassals of the Tetsujin in the prisoner's hold here. That's actually pretty fantastic to be able to do that. Now... Unfortunately, because of Drasalda being killed, um, we now only have three clan members, and I'm going to have to do something about that. So I'm not... In oh, hello. Well, that's a very strong army, isn't it? Wow. That's actually kind of, uh, kind of a bit scary, but I think they're probably going to run out of food relatively soon. I mean, they're almost at a thousand... Personally, I feel I, I don't really trust the AI whenever they have an, an army that large. It's usually going to end up perishing very quickly because they usually do not buy enough food to be able to sustain such a great number 
of units in one place. So let's just hope that that continues to be the case here because if it doesn't, then we're going to be having some huge problems. Anyway, I think that's probably going to be it for this episode. And, uh, oh, they actually took Saniopa. Right. Well, there's only 59 there. You know what? Before we end this episode off, I'm actually going to just be taking this straight quick because I want to show you just how fast we can actually take stuff if we put our mind to it. Because just, just look at this, 59 units. I'm not even going to build any trebuchets, all right? So let's see how long it takes us. So I am, I'm, I'm basically like keeping an eye on the time. All right, so here we go. Boom, done. Took it in under 10 seconds. That's it. Done. Easy. Yeah. So that's what I mean. Basically, what you can do is if you know the formula for, the, you know, the whole like auto resolving thing, if the defenders do not have an extreme amount of people in there, you're going to be able to build siege towers, build battering ram, and it doesn't matter whether the walls are down or not. Obviously, if the walls are down, then you're going to have a much easier time. But you've got to remember that obviously, in those cases, um, it is also uh, dependent on the amount of units that are in the garrison too, because if you have a huge amount of people in there, so I'm, t I'm talking about like, like, I don't know, 200 plus or something, then it's probably advisable to uh, take the walls down before you auto-resolve, even if you have siege tower, battering ram, etc. already built. Although, saying that, I have actually been in that situation where there have been about 200 or so units in, in a garrison, and I have auto-resolved successfully. So it also depends, of course, on your own combat strength and stuff like that. But it is extremely easy to take things once you realize what you need to do to make the auto-resolve just that much more effective. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of um, an idea as to what you can do in your own game. And otherwise, that is indeed going to be the end of this episode. I thank you very much for watching. I hope you're having a good day, evening, morning, whatever, wherever you are, and I'll see you next time.